from chintzy to madre stick silk road textiles in Latin America. Hi there, I am Ayron Zucchelli. I am a designer, consultant, and researcher of ethnic garments. And today I would like to start a discussion with you guys about two textiles that were very important in Latin America. The chintz and the madres. A spoiler alert, we're going to talk briefly about what they are, where they were originally, how did the Silk World commerce provide the opportunity for them to arrive from Portugal and later in Brazil, how they are used in Brazil and how they are now part of the our cultural heritage. Uh, and this will be said in a decolonial light, so maybe have in mind that I will not sound like your old professor. But before I start, I would like to thank you all for your interest in being here. This is not exactly a mainstream theme, so you being here tell me that you are a very caring and educating person that is trying to even further your education and that is very remarkable. So first things first, thank you all for being here. And I appreciate your time being here with me. Topic number one, chintz and sheetha. What is chintz? Chintz is a vibrant cotton fabric from India that can either be painted or printed. And they've been doing that for quite a while, since the 14th century. According to Sarafi, in the collective book, The Cloth That Changed the World, this fabric has been used for everything from village dress to palace furnishes of great dynasties, Mughal, Nayak, and Golconda. Uh, each is associated with the Chen school and their finest works. I'm not going to repeat myself talking too much about things that you already know, but the terminology chintz is <laughs> but the terminology chintz has some controversy. There are many techniques of chintz, but most are divided in print and painted. However, saying painted gives the wrong impression because when you think about something that is painted, you think the paint is on the cloth and if you would touch it, you would be able to feel the paint. But when we are talking about this fabric, the paint actually gets infused in the fibers, completely soaking in the pigment in the cloth. And the process is much more intricate than just depositing paint on a brush with a stroke. It's so much more than that. In the early days of the Silk Road, while commerce was already strong and had long been going between what today we know as India, Pakistan and China, the Europeans didn't even think about what silk was and as soon as they had a taste of it, they love it. But the silk routes traded in other goods and textiles as well, like cotton. Cotton was desired because it was easy to wash and it was comfortable to wear, both during summer and winter. Archaeological discoveries show that India has most likely been exporting cotton since the Bronze Age. And with no surprise, they mastered the technique of cultivating cotton, harvesting it, spinning, uh, weaving, dyeing and bleaching it. There, they created the finest cotton threads the world has ever seen. And even today, machines can replicate it. Despite the Roman trade with India, the chintz craze only happened when Portugal started to bring massive amounts of cloth to the European continent in the 15th century. And we know that because we have documentation of ships cargo and art of the period. Now, we need to understand that European clothes at the period were kind of bland. Most Europeans to have any sort of pattern in their clothes, it had to be embroidered. Or woven. And that process is not only long, but also very, very much. And also it prevented the garment to be washed because the colors will, do, will fade or it will blend together, just bleeding. The Indian fabrics, however, they were in such intricate level of advanced textile technology that those splendid fabrics rapidly become objects of desire all across Europe because they could be washed. 
they were so desired that many countries uh, issue a ban on imports of chintz to try to protect their local fabric mills, France and England being two of them. But the problem was already deeper. The wealthy didn't want to wear plain wool like any other peasants. They all wanted chintz, Indian chintz. But with the bans, what can you do? Either through black market or counterfeits. And that's how imitations of Indian chintzes became to swarm Europe. Sarafi emphasizes that European efforts to monopolize and imitate Indian chintz provoked unprecedented economic and cultural reverberations, which studies link to everything from Britain's so-called Industrial Revolution to the British colonization of India and then the intensification of slavery in Americas. Now, you probably know a lot about chintz and calicos uh, of Britain and America, but what you may not know is that in Portugal, those were originally called pintados, meaning painted. Because in Europe, no fabric was painted. They didn't have that textile technology. We're talking about 15th century here, and uh, the Portuguese had hegemony of chintz imports. But after Britain finally lifted its ban, and Portugal lost supremacy of chintz imports to England, Back then, most people started to identify uh, in the markets those fabrics as chintz because that's what the British were calling. Uh, so Portugal incorporated the name chita. And for our study, I'm going to talk about chintz being the international textile and chita being the Portuguese and Brazilian textile. And we have very little uh, textile fragments of chintz that had survived in, in Portugal. As a matter of fact, this is the only one that I found and is also on, on the book. It shows a highly complex design that is uh, that utilizes many different colors and stripes designs uh, that were highly appreciated in Portugal. So here you can see the stripes. Uh, they are solid and patterned and then you have in a different color, most likely two different colors, um, a border that is very intricate and again it was made in the 17th century. Because the popularity of Indian goods, Portugal invaded India and it took it as a colony uh, that was called Portuguese India. Uh, it was from 1505 until 1961. And during this time, they lost its dominion to the Dutch, the British, and finally to the people of India. So here I have some students to ask, but wasn't India a colony of Britain? Yes, but not entirely. You see, that is a very vast uh, region and some cities that today is India were considered a different country or a different colony like Goa. Goa has a lot of people that until today speaks uh, Portuguese and um, it's very different, the culture is very different and uh, we also have a lot of uh, people that were refugees uh, in Rio, so uh, there's that. <laughs> Most chants used in the Portuguese kingdom and its colonies were imported from India, but in 16th century until early 19th century, uh, Portugal had also a famous style of chintz and it was called Chita de Alcobaça. Uh, according to the Center Portugal World Heritage Sites, they say that Chita is a cloth printed fabric brought from India by the Portuguese in the 15th century. In Alcabasa, it became part of the lives of the locals in the following century. Even Gil Vicente noted the habit in the play Farsa dos Almogreves, uh, the richly colored pattern with birds, flowers, animals, fruits, cornucopias, and even nests are traditional motifs used in Chita, uh, which has become recognized brand of Alcobasa. The play that they are talking about was published in 1526, and it was just right after they 
invaded Brazil. And it talks about a priest complaining about his broke lord about lack of payment. The play is very funny and it has one of Brazil's VIP and the most famous Pero Vaz de Caminha. Pero Vaz was a scriver, uh, a scriver, a scrivener. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is kind of impossible to pronounce. So Pedro Vaz de Caminha was a scrivener and he wrote the first letter to uh, King of Portugal about founding Brazil. As a matter of fact, Portugal was basically uh, already addicted to chintz back then and other Indian goods that because they were trying to find an easier route to get to India, they accidentally discovered Brazil that we now call the great colonizer invasion. But let's go back to the play. The play is interesting because it shows an intricate aspect of Portuguese elites and uh, later it was going to be reflected in Brazilian's elite as well. Uh, it's the fact that many of them are scammers. <laughs> Despite living in wealth, uh, they do absolutely nothing or let's say that they do anything to avoid paying fair wages uh, to the working class and this is how the play goes. This is the priest, the Capelão, saying Capelão, e logo daí a um ano, pela ajuda de casar, uma orfa mandaste dar meio côvado de pano de alcobaça pra tosar. So I'm not going to translate because it kind of loses uh, the uh, rhythm but in it, the chaplain protests about the lack of payment and it is saying that that to his lord uh, and he's reminding him that he doesn't really do much charity uh, and in one episode that he says a year ago that lord in order to help an orphan to get married he ordered them to give her half a cubit of alcobasa fabric uh, that is the chintz uh, so she could cut and make it into a dress however a covado or a cubit is 45 centimeters or 17.7 .7 inches. He gave her half and that being 22.5 centimeters or 8.85 inches. Uh, enough for her to maybe, maybe, she could maybe do a pocketbook for her husband or maybe her stomacher if she would add more fabric depending on her size I don't know so very cheap he wanted to sound grand because he was giving uh, you know shita de alcobasa but in the end you couldn't even do a stomacher. So more than a hundred years after Portugal was already making chintz in Europe the first Amsterdam uh, factory would open. According to Natalie Casset, she found the document evidence. In the spring of 1678, two VOC merchants from Amsterdam, Jacob Tergo and Heinrich Popta, sat a block printing workshop in the city of Amersfoort, northwest of Utrecht. Uh, together with a man called Louis Celebi, from likely, he was an Armenian, Amsterdam was home to significant Armenian community at the time. And the city records relating to the proposal of the project, we read that they want to establish a workshop for imaging, coloring and dyeing, all kinds of East Indian cotton, which has never happened in Netherlands before. Their arguments seem convincing because uh, they believe that it will result in new business and income for the city. As a result, the city will become more important nationally and internationally, which in turn will attract new businesses. And they got a unanimous positive vote result. Because of the Napoleonic invasion, most of Alcabasa techniques were lost and with the destruction of the town. Um, but later, in the end of the 19th century, 
uh, Shita was rescued from obscurity and regained popularity in Victorian times. And you can still find factories um, till this day. Now, to make it easier to remember, uh, while Dutch chintzes were famous for their reds and blue backgrounds, you sometimes see purples, that at the time it was known as pews, and some green, but they were very expensive, so they're not very common. The most famous British chintz are the ones with the white background and the cascading print to reflect a more rococo. Uh, style fashionable on the time when the lift when they lift the ban uh, from the imports but you can also find uh, dark background ones the Portuguese Chita de Alcobaça are famous for their motives also uh, the designs often contain a striking contrast stripes they are like tafa the museum Sorry, the Museu Nacional do Traje, uh, in partnership with Casa Museu Vieira Natividade, had an exhibition showing their 20th century uh, chitas and contemporary examples as well. The chintz is acknowledged by historians to be the first global fashion. It was worn and imitated all around the world. With the growth in popularity, the chintz became mass-produced in Europe, and with that came the demand for more cotton uh, that started to be cultivated in a plantation style, and subsequently uh, the intensification of slavery and the necessity of human traffic to supply the fields for those plantations in certain jobs people died so like in so horrible conditions so often and so fast that in many places it was easier to abduct and import another person from africa than to maintain those that were enslaved of lives in brazil for instance some people were fed one corn hob a day and despite Africans have been in trade with India and have been wearing cotton way before um, Americans and Europeans, the ones that produced the best cotton weren't able to wear it. In the Americas, it was very common to have sumptuary laws forbidden women of color to wear chintz and other upscale products. In Brazil, for instance, in the 18th century, it was forbidden the use of silk, Indian or Dutch chintz and, other, and, and others. However, you can see through drawings of tra travelers' diaries uh, that women that drawing, drawings, uh, you can see through drawings and travelers' diaries that women did indeed wear them. Uh, both free and enslaved women. Here we have two illustrations from Brazilian artist Carlos Julião in the 18th century depicting free BIPOC women, BIPOC meaning black indigenous and people of color. Uh, so they are wearing European chins. The first one being a famous actress of the time and she has her hair down, she has uh, her shoe uh, without, I forgot the name, with, without her shoe buckle um, and she is still getting ready <laughs> and but even though that ritual of grooming oneself in the 18th century wasn't necessarily um, shameful, uh, people did receive calls and guests in their uh, bed chambers and people would witness a woman getting, you know, dressed and prepared for the day. Uh, that was not very typical to do it at the street. So um, Carlos thought that that was that was very uh, interesting to um, capture as a drawing. And the other one that is my absolute favorite, you see a woman of color um, in very very beautiful uh, chemise that was chintz. 
that was embroidery and uh, that had fabric manipulation and chintz and a skirt that is also very very beautiful also showing the striped pattern um, and she's receiving a letter from a very old gentleman of European descent and you can see that he's you know wearing his wig and he looks richly dressed she is also richly dressed by the way uh, she may have been freed we don't know seems like it because of the amount of jewelry and she's also wearing shoes and socks which is also very expensive in Brazil back then uh, and she is absolutely disgusted by the fact that this old gentleman is uh, giving her a love letter like you cringy dude mind your business sir no thank you uh, here we have a Mexican casta painting from Miguel Cabrera from of 1763 showing a black woman wearing chintz in the cap the caption say in Spanish from Spaniard to black is born a mulatto woman in 1808 Brazil was forbidden to produce fine fabrics and the national prediction was to feed the coffee industry with sacks and to dress the enslaved people with something like calico uh, Brazilians could only buy from Portugal so when the ports were open to friendly nations rapidly the cities were filled with British goods and our counterfeits and he was trying to copy British people that were copying Portuguese, that were copying Indians, that the Brazilian sheet that was born. From the Carimbó traditional wear in the north to the July festivities in the northeast and central Brazil, to Carnaval in Rio and Umbingada, Jongo, Congada, and many other BIPOC cultural expressions. In the South and Southeast, this fabric is present on everything and everyone has worn at least one variety and if they belonged to an uh, ethnic group in Brazil. Through all the years with uh, the end of Portuguese India, the Industrial Revolution and the abolish of slavery as an acceptable acceptable practice, uh, Shita has become more accessible to BIPOCs in Brazil and with mass production it was no longer desirable um, by the elites because it became associated with poor people's fabric, folk wear, uh, xenophobia, racism, eugenic beliefs and of the end of um, Victorian times and turn of the century molded Brazilian elites uh, easily since they were desperate trying to assimilate and emulate European tastes and fashion. So chintzy became a synonym of inferior quality and anything folk became to be considered old. Uh, I had a beautiful cheetah, cheetah dress that had cashew prints, not cashew nuts, the actual fruit, the apple of the cashew, and it was absolutely beautiful. But I was very bullied because of that. I was already in college, and my colleagues in law school thought that chintz or shita wasn't an appropriate fabric for lawyers to wear. I ended up donating that dress. The dress was fabulous and how much I regret doing that. Uh, and that's why I'm going to recreate the dress. My mom made it, it was handmade and it was perfect. And I'm gonna have to do it again. <laughs> Today, Brazilian chita is used mostly in furniture, uh, traditional party decorations, and folk wear. It is not widely worn every day, but since the tropicalism movement in the 70s, uh, there is a renaissance 
for this textile on the elite circles and um, new brands are now reinventing the patterns on softer cottons and we are now exporting to the world again. I'm very happy to see the Brazilian Chita school and our cultural heritage is now fashionable once more. Uh, the process of making Chita is interesting and due to our limits, <laughs> I am not going to uh, talk it about it right now, but we're gonna do that in a next video. <laughs> Please join and uh, click here or here to see more about the madras because I can't put everything on a video. <laughs> but I hope to see you guys in the madras uh, video. Please come and join me on the on the comments. I want to see what you guys think of it, like. Have you heard of anything that uh, that I said here? Was anything new? Uh, did I say in a different way? Have you ever heard about the colonial uh, type of education? Did you have that at school or in college? Did you have access to this? So let me know in the comments what you guys think. And uh, until next time. <laughs>